Welcome to Applied Mathematical Finance. I like to start a new section on multi-curve interest rate structures and collateralization. So collateralization is now the main topic. Yeah? Um, and this is important because what I will show you here in this section is what is actually going on in the market. So the interest rate theory that we have derived so far is a little bit the textbook theory, and it is not the stuff that is going on in the market. So let me start and by um, um, yeah, um, yeah sorry. So let me, let me start with a small introduction. What is wrong in our theory so far? Let's go back to our definition of the zero copper bond. It was the atomic object that was uh, it was more or less our first definition that li li lied on the basis yeah, of all this interest rate theory. So we assumed that there is a guaranteed payment of unit currency traded, and the value of this is the zero cover bond, and everybody can trade in this financial product. Well, this is not the case. Yeah? So the assumption that all counterparties can trade in the same zero copper bond, yeah? so this is an idealization. Okay, and you know this from your experience, if you go to a bank and you ask for a loan, yeah? they check, okay, how credible are you? And maybe you get a different interest rate depending on your credibility because the interest rate covers more than just waiting for the money. So the same if a company issues a bond. So assume there are two different issuers. So there is A and there is B. So then if they issue a bond, they want to collect money from the market. Yeah, maybe they have a large project. Then the market will judge the project. Yeah, how credible is this project? And will pay maybe different coupons yeah, for this bond. Yeah, or uh, require. So the market will maybe require different payments of coupons. Yeah, to give the money to this project to this company. So the two will see, if they issue bonds, they will see maybe different zero coupon bond prices. Actually, they will issue coupon bonds, but if we think of zero coupon bonds, they will see different zero coupon bond prices. So it looks a little bit as if everybody has its own interest rate curve. I have mine, you have yours, everybody has its own interest rate curve. We can still make the assumption that I can trade in this zero copper bond, in my zero copper bond, in, say, may arbitrary amounts. Yeah. So um, I make the assumption that an issuer can trade positive and negative values in its own coupon bonds. Well, um, unissuing as coupon bond, yeah, the negative, it looks a bit strange, but if you think that um, this is just taking back a coupon bond that has previously issued, yeah, then you can also have an interpretation for the negative value. So if you assume that in net, yeah, you are always borrowing money, of course you can give money back, which is then the negative position. So assume that I can trade in zero copper bonds, but now everybody has its own little universe of such zero copper bonds. Of course, within such a framework, you can still define all our objects. Yeah, so all the objects that we had, yeah, like forward rates, swap rates, they could still be defined. If a, if a corresponding financial product exists, such as trading strategy, yeah, maybe it's a question, but you can just define these objects. But now some question uh, arise. So does now each issuer sees its own derivative value? So if you value a financial derivative, is now everybody seeing a different value 
for the same financial derivative. Yeah, because if the zero corporate bond is the discount factor, so the value that you multiply a payment yeah, to get today's value, uh, then everybody would value payments differently. So everybody sees different values. So we have a few questions now. Yeah? So everything appears to be wrong. Yeah. So if the two counterparties like to say agree on a swap and like to reference um, an interest rate in a der derivative, uh, which which interest rate should they reference? Yeah? So is there a forward rate? for that guy, for that guy. So which one is the one that we agree on? So is there a common interest rate for all counterparties? And is this forward rate still a martingale under some common measure? Yeah, so does all this stuff we did still work? Okay, so is it still a martingale? And can there be a financial product that has a unique value for all participants. So is there still a single value or do we have now two prices, each counterparty sees a different price and on which price do they agree? Very confusing. So the first problem uh, could be solved. Okay, we just could create some kind of process that creates an average of all quoted forward rates. Yeah. And then we could say, okay, we agree on this interest rate as the reference in a financial product. That was done with the LIBOR rate and it had issues. Yeah. And maybe you can read a little bit uh, on Wikipedia, for example. I will later show you here the SOFA rate. And there's also written why this rate was introduced because the banks could um, manipulate this. Yeah. So here the forward rate, the LIBOR has been published yeah, um, by banks. yeah. So, and because it is derived from banks, daily quotes, banks were able to manipulate this. Yeah? So we could think of some kind of process to create a reference rate. But for the other two questions, and for example, the last one, we should study collateralization and the nice thing is, if we now study this, at the end of this session, we will recover the single curve theory. So a collateralized market, if it is set up correctly, will create for all participants a single curve interest rate world. Okay, and that's an interesting, interesting aim. So the motivation for collateralization comes from a different aspect. It is the mitigation of exposure and counterparty risk. So assume you agree on a swap. Yeah, first let's maybe assume there's a single curve word and you agree on some swap. You agree on a financial product and the financial product has initially value zero, for example, you agree here um, on a pass swap. Yeah? We just like to trade a swap and we fixed the fixed leg to be the par swap rate, then the swap is zero. But now time moves on and the market moves. And if the market moves in favor of me, the value of this financial product will become different from zero. Yeah? So I made a profit. I made a profit in the sense that I have a financial product that is now a positive value. So it's still a book value. Yeah? I do not have the cash. It's still a book value, but I have a profit on my book. Yeah, but now this constitutes an exposure. One counterparty owes money to the other counterparty. Yeah? So the one that sees the negative value owes money to the one that sees the positive value. So you see, we already had different valuations, but only with respect to the sign. So from which perspective you, you um, observe the product, but this is just flipping, receiving and paying. 
that's trivial. So one counterparty sees a positive value, the other one sees a negative value, one owes something to the other one. And it could happen that the counterparty that needs to pay goes bankrupt. Then I lost my money, I lost the book value, yeah? so I lost the V of little t if it was a positive value for me. So this value could be lost. So to mitigate this risk, yeah, this exposure, this counterparty risk that somebody does not pay, I could require some kind of collateral. Yeah? So give me something that covers my losses in case you cannot pay. And yeah, this collateral, it could be bonds. Yeah, So you give me some kind of bonds you own. Uh, you could give me your car or whatever. Yeah, You can think of different types of collateral assets, yeah, if you like. But let's consider the case where the collateral is just cash. So it means that you deposit some cash to me and I can use this cash yeah, for whatever. But uh, when you pay me, I give you the cash back. back. So the cash sits there uh, just in case that you don't pay me back. So for simplicity, I will consider cash collateral. So the situation is that I have here a claim. So I should receive some money. There is a claim in the future. And I would like to have this collateralized. So I would like to receive something now and then when the claim is fulfilled i give you back what i have received now yeah so to mitigate the exposure we request collateral paid in little t and if the claim has been received i just return this collateral then observe that actually this means that instead of paying in the future i pay you now this looks a bit strange and it's strange if it is a loan but for a financial derivative this means that I just balance all future claims I just balance them now and maybe you already know this there's the margin call yeah so this procedure is done on an exchange yeah so if there are claims or liabilities they have to be paid yeah collateralized um, today yeah. And if there's a change in the claim, there will be a margin call. So you have to adjust for this. That's a very common procedure to reduce the counterparty risk, the risk of losing um, you know, profits from future uh, cash flows. So now comes an interesting thing. If you think of cash collateral, um, if you deposit the cash to me because I should receive something in the future. I could use this cash. I could operate with this and you cannot use it. You cannot operate with this, but legally it belongs to you. So maybe I should pay interest on this. So if you deposit the collateral amount C of TI, we too agree that the receiver, so for example, me, if I receive it, pays interest on this. So the two counterparties agree that the receiver should pay interest on the collateral. So the collateral rate is agreed by us. So we agree on any interest rate R superscript C and after a certain time period, so at a later point in time, the collateral has been accrued. No? So by me, yeah. so not by you, who posted the collateral, who deposited the, the collateral to the original value, the CTI multiplied with if it is a simple forward rate, one plus interest rate times period length, or here in exponential notation multiplied with exponential RC times delta TI. So the collateral 
should accrue and the interest rate is agreed as part of the collateral contract. Okay, so that's important. We agree on this as part of of the collateral contracts. And there could be different collateral contracts. We could also agree that we do not pay interest on this. So the collateral interest rate could be zero. Yeah? Um, for certain financial products, this this uh, is the case. Yeah, There are also futures yeah, where it is a little bit handled differently. But now let's assume that we agree on some, say, natural collateral rate. So that's just the definition of the collateral rate, so the collateral rate is an interest rate agreed as part of the collateral contract. A collateralized trade should maybe have a different value compared to an uncollateralized trade. Yeah, because it is more secure, it is collateralized. So the value should change. So it's not clear what is the value, and hence it is not clear what is the collateral I should deposit? Yeah. And it's a little bit interlinked. So to understand the value of the trade, maybe I have to know the amount of collateral that is deposited. And to find the right amount that I should deposit, I have to understand what is the value. So let's go to this question and first consider the fully deterministic case. And maybe I consider also a little bit a stupid product. I consider a collateralized zero copper bond. So assume there is a single payment in the future. There is a liability. So a payment of X at a future point in time. So at T equals TN. How much collateral should we deposit in T0 to cover this X? So what I'm looking at is what is now here the collateral C of T0? Okay, so if I consider the deterministic case, so what do I mean by this? So I mean, there is no change in the market. There's no market risk and no market move and interest rates are deterministic. So the world does not change. Well, I have that the collateral accrues at a certain collateral rate. Yeah, so there is here the multiplication with exponential R of Ti, delta Ti, yeah, for every period. Yeah? So from here to there, for every period, from Ti to Ti plus one, I have that the collateral is accrued. So this answers my question. How much collateral should I deposit here? Well, that much that if I now accumulate, accrue the collateral at the collateral rate, that the final amount matches the X. Okay, so the final amount should match the X. So C of T0 multiplied with exponential, the sum of all collateral rates times the period length should match the final amount X. That's the amount of collateral I should deposit in T0. That's the right amount. That's the right amount if the word is static. Well, you see, you can now solve this. Just divide here by this factor. So dividing by this factor means that I get here a minus. And I have that C of T0 is X times exponential minus the interest rates over the period. And you see that this is like evaluation. I now value the final amount by multiplying 
with a zero Cooper bond that is formed by the collateral rate. So I could say that this is a zero Cooper bond that pays one unit in Tn observed in T0, and it is somehow the zero Cooper bond that is associated with the collateral rate. So they should be here in RC, yeah? the collateral rate RC. Yeah? So also here, RC, I always call this collateral rate R superscript C. Yeah? It is the rate on which we agree. It does not need to be any reasonable rate on the market. Yeah, We could agree on some arbitrarily fixed rate, fixed rate. But this process of collateralization induces here evaluation in the sense that this valuation determines the amount of collateral that we deposit. But since there is no future cash flow anymore, this then represents also the value of the collateralized rate. Because what is the value of this? Okay. There's no cash flow in the future, and the value of C paying C of T0 today is just C of T0. So this is like bootstrapping. So we are creating this out of nothing. It is consistent in itself. This is the right amount of collateral to match the final, the final value. Yeah, I can now introduce a kind of numeraire and just define that uh, collateralized. Okay, there's a typo here. Hmm. That a collateralized derivative should have this value where I take the expectation with respect to my collateral. Numeraire, so I have here my accrual account in superscript C, which is the account that accrues according to the collateral rate. Well, this was just an intuition here. Yeah, If there is no market risk and the market is static, and I also assume that interest rates are deterministic, and this here is a quite a bold move that I introduce some kind of numeraire and just say, okay, now I value as I did before. So we have to prove this result here. So we have to prove here this number 107. Before I prove this, what happens if the market moves? So the collateral amount should match the derivative value at any time. So that means initially I start by setting the collateral to the right value, value now in sense as much collateral as I need, such that if it just sits there alone and accrues, it will match the right amount. So now the collateral accrues. So I start here with my CI, C of TI. And it accrues here at the collateral rate over one period. Yeah. But then it could happen that the market could have moved. So the value of the derivative should exhibit a corresponding change in the value. So it's not clear if this accrued collateral matches the collateral you should deposit in the next time step. Yeah, because it could that the market moves means also maybe the expectation of what you get, the X has changed, and you maybe need to deposit a different collateral amount to now match the different X. So there is something called the margin call. The margin call is that they are asking that you update the collateral amount to match the new value. Okay, so you already have this collateral amount in the collateral account and 
this is now the new value. Okay, so the difference of the two is the margin call. So I have that this here is the margin call. And if I update my previous collateral by this margin call, then I am in the game again. So my new collateral now matches the moved value, yeah, the required collateral for the next time step. So the margin call is actually the guy that is generating profit and losses. Huh? So the collateral just sits there on a bank account and is accumulating and you just put money back and in there. Yeah? And in the end, yeah, the collateral account has the right value. So it reflects a little bit your profit and losses, what you can pull out when there's too much collateral or what you can put in is a loss yeah, so that you have to deposit more collateral, yeah? assuming that the collateral belongs to the other per person, giving away collateral is like a loss. So now we have the two things, yeah? Collateral account accrues and margining is adjusting for market moves. It now remains to prove this number 107. So it remains that we can build a solid, yeah, mathematically profound uh, valuation theory on some pseudo numeraire, which is given by the collateral account. To prove this, let me recapitulate risk neutral valuation. So, how do you arrive at the universal pricing theorem? So actually, how do you arrive at this thing that you can express the value of a financial derivative as an expectation of the numeraire relative value in the future multiplied with the numeraire today? How do you derive this? And this is now risk neutral valuation on two slides. Yeah? Very quick, but I believe I have all the essence here. So first step is we choose some numeraire, okay, so there's some numeraire n, and we, oops, and we assume there is an equivalent martingale measure qn, such that all relative prices, so the si divided by n, they are qn martingales. So I assume my market is complete, and I can find a unique equivalent martingale measure. Then I just define the value of the financial derivative through the martingale relation. Yeah? So the value process, the value of my financial derivative divided by the numeraire should be a Q martingale two. Yeah, but this is just a definition. Like I will do a little bit boldly for the collateralized derivative, we just define this. And now we prove that we can construct a replication portfolio, a self-financed replication portfolio that replicates this value process. So this then justifies this definition and this then justifies that we value all financial derivatives in this way. The justification is that we can at this cost, so the cost to set up this portfolio is exactly V of little t. At this cost, we can set up a replication portfolio and the replication portfolio is self-financing. So this is the only cost we have to pay. So this definition here is an ansatz, and now we prove that we can replicate this stochastic process by trading in the assets N, S, 1, 2, S, M. So how does this step work? So the next step is that we have by the Martingale representation theorem, that we can, yeah, my market is complete, so that we can represent another martingale, which is my V divided by N, by a linear combination of 
the given martingales, the SI divided by N. So these guys here are martingales, and now I can represent my V divided by N by a linear combination, a portfolio of the other martingales. Well, if the market is complete, yeah, you can think of if these guys here are now Ito stochastic processes. So these guys here are Ito stochastic processes. So every guy has maybe a DWI. Uh, and there are only M different DWIs in the whole game. So I have all the different DWIs inside the SI divided by N. So I can represent all Brownian drivers that are inside the other martingale by the corresponding linear combination. So maybe just Ito's lemma and match coefficients that is behind this to find the phi i. So if you have now the phi i, well, you see, since I divided by n, there is the n missing, yeah? Because n divided by n is a martingale Anyway, the differential of n divided by n, d1, is zero. So there is a quantity still left. It is the phi zero. The phi zero is the coefficient in front of the n. And that's the stuff that makes it self-financing. So all the money you need, you take from the n. All the money you get back, you put into the n. So we can now define the portfolio as being self-financing by defining the phi zero you know, such that whenever we have money in excess, we put it into the end and um, we need money, yeah, we draw it from the end. So we define phi zero such that the difference of phi zero is always given by the difference that we trade in the other assets. Yeah? So whenever we change our portfolio, so that here is the change of the portfolio. Yeah, So we need that amount of money for the change in the corresponding asset. Yeah, Then we put this into the N. Then my portfolio is self-financing. And now you can just check that the replication portfolio divided by the numerator Okay, so this here is zero from the self-financing condition. This is just the DSI divided by N multiplied with the phi I. And this is from my Martingale representation theorem, just the DV divided by N. So now integrate this, you have that the replication portfolio divided by the numerator equals the value of the derivative divided by the numerator, our ansatz. Yeah? When you choose the correct initial condition, yeah? so I choose the correct initial condition, yeah? multiply with n and we are done. Okay, so we have a replication portfolio. So that's it. Yeah? So Martingale representation theorem, choosing the portfolio self-financing, checking that the uh, portfolio is replicating the derivative. Two slides. Uh, yeah, you can check that in the special situation when the numerator is locally risk-free, so dn is rn dt, yeah, then you can actually express the value process in terms of the martingale part. The martingale part is the part that contains all the DWs. Yeah? So the DWs are inside here. The DWIs, they are inside here. Yeah? The corresponding martingales, SI divided by N, combined into this. And this is the drift part. So the drift part is the RV dt. Let's do this now for our collateralized derivative. So I will just do the same step. My ansatz is I define the value of the collateralized derivative now as the expectation under QN. Okay. Um, v divided by my 
numerea that comes from the collateral account accrual rate. And the measure that you have here on top is the measure that is associated with a locally risk-free numerea, DN, RN, DT. Yeah? So QN is the corresponding Martingale measure. So this here is a Martingale by definition. I have the same thing again. It's a Martingale by definition. So I can apply the Martingale representation theorem and search for appropriate phi i. So my martingales are the SI divided by N. Uh, so it is the N, not the NC, SI divided by N. For that reason, there is an obscure uh, scaling factor here in front. But note, uh, so the diff scaling factor is just in front of the diff uh, differential. So if this here is um, a martingale, yeah, then N divided by NC multiplied with this is also a martingale. Huh? Or you can multiply NC divided by N on this side, and it's also a martingale. So there is this little factor in front, but that does not change the martingale representation theory. So I can find uh, corresponding phi i's. And my claim is now I can build a self-financing replication portfolio with this phi i that is replicating this value when it is collateralized. So this is an important addition. Step for the self-financing is the same. So you divide here by n. So you see that si divided by n The phi zero is still a free parameter. So choose phi zero to have the portfolio self financing. Yeah? So the phi zero is adjusted to finance the trading in the underlying S. So this gives me here my phi zero. So now the portfolio is self financing. Is the portfolio replicating? And the answer is first, no. So if you just do now the same, you look at the replication portfolio, P divided by N, differential of that. This is the differential of phi zero plus the sum SI divided by N, the differential of phi I, and plus phi I, the differential of SI divided by N. The second order term does not appear because the phi i's are previsible. So this is as before that this part here goes away because we have chosen the portfolio self-financing. But now this is not replicating and it's not replicating because here I have S divided by N. But on the other side, I have Vc divided by Nc. So my Martingale representation theorem was giving me that the phi i's are chosen such that the sum phi i d s i divided by n equals Nc divided by n d Vc Nc. That is the Martingale representation theorem. But if you now like to replace this nc here with an n uh, because I like to integrate on both sides and then multiply with n to get an equation p equals vc. If you replace this, then you get an additional term and this additional term is the difference of the interest rate r in my numerea and the interest rate rc in my collateral account. Uh, so for the last step here, If you apply the differential dv divided by nc, uh, so this is dv divided by n, the guy that I would like to have. Okay, then I need to multiply with n again and divide by nc. Okay, there is no second order term yeah, because the n's do not have a dw. Okay, so this is then the dv superscript C divided by N. So this is now this guy here with the N below, uh, but from 
that guy. Here you get the difference of the two interest rates. Yeah. So DN is NR DT. DNC is NC. RC dt, yeah? so the ratio of the two, it's exponential r minus rc that is popping out there. So now you do the same, yeah? Integrate on both sides and multiply with n. Integrate on both sides and multiply with n. And you see that we almost have replication but there is a mismatch because the collateral account and the numerea have different interest rates. Okay, now comes the funny thing. This mismatch here is exactly covered by the collateral account accruing at the right rate RC. Because we have, in addition, a second asset lying around and it is our collateral account. Our collateral account DC fulfills the equation that the change in collateral is RC times VC DT because the collateral account has initially the value VC and it accrues at the interest rate RC. So there is an additional cash flow coming from accruing the collateral account. So if you now look at the value dc divided by n, then this is exactly rc minus r, vc divided by n dt. So this is exactly the term that we have here. Okay, so that is the one that is paying us the mismatch to the yeah, risk neutral valuation. So in sum, we have that our replication portfolio is replicating this value process if we have the collateral account in addition. So everything fits together. So V superscript C is the correct value process for a collateralized derivative if we have a collateral account of that size sitting aside accruing at the collateral rate. Okay, so uh, time's up. And next time I have a few more comments and I show you that we can now recover from this a single curve interest rate theory. So when everybody is collateralizing all the financial derivative, yeah, we actually create a new market that has the collateral account as the numerea and it has zero copper bonds related to this numerea yeah, and forward rates and all the single curve theory is then correct in the collateralized market. That was it for today.